not part of the part of today's discussion. Um, and we grew 25% this week. Welcome, welcome. Um, and also, I, I mentioned to those that were here in the beginning, um, in order to try to reach more people, I'm going to start recording these and posting them on K4 um, so that people can see what it's like and if they want to come and have any ideas. So last week when I was soliciting ideas, it was brought up that, you know, one of the things that is not acknowledged or is at least not acknowledged as much is when transitioning into assisted living or independent living facility like this, um, part of it is, you know, that we kind of lose our purpose or what we've kind of grown to see our purpose as being, you know, a lot of times we're, I say we, I'm not at this point yet. And so keep that in mind with a grain of salt that when you give me these topics, I get to go research them and put something together. But I am hoping that your experience and wealth of knowledge with that experience is going to contribute to the discussions. But um, part of that is, you know, we, we like to think about living our lives with intent and typically our intention with life is surrounded by our family and our occupation and so our goals our life goals sometimes align with with those things and so when we retire or when we go into assisted living or, or um, a different environment lots of things change and one of the things that we want to acknowledge is this kind of idea of a sense of purpose it's not like we want to move into a place like ovation and then just be like okay that's it i'm just gonna bide my time and and uh wait for my time to be done right and so let's start i want to kind of get your ideas what when you talk about life's purpose what does that even mean it's kind of an out there it can be an abstract idea but what is what is that what is a purpose find joy Okay, to find, you say, what's that? To Someone bring you joy? joy? Absolutely, to be able to find joy. I love that. That was one of the definitions of purpose and looking at it is, is our ability to find joy in our circumstances, regardless of what they are. And, and they to determine a goal. To determine a goal, okay? Goals. Internal, external goals. Both. Both, all right. Give you some guidance of something to work toward. Mm -hmm. Any other ideas? All right, well, I, as you have contributions, please just shout or raise your hand or do whatever. Um, uh, go ahead. To stay healthy. Uh, to stay healthy. Yes, and so you need, the, in my mind, I guess you need the exercise. You need to do something. Uh, Take care of the body so that we can experience. Body, so can continue to enjoy life. Absolutely, we're gonna definitely dig into that. Um, in kind of looking at this, I don't know if you are familiar with a book called Man's Search for Meaning. It's a very famous book by a guy named Viktor Frankl. And um, he started writing this book. He's a psychiatrist or a psychologist. I can't remember which. But um, he was writing this book called Man's Search uh, for Meaning. And he was getting really close to publishing his book. And then the war started and he happened to be on, um, based on his upbringing and his religious beliefs, he found himself in a in, um, concentration camp on two different occasions. So here this man is brought up, psychologist ready to change the world, uh, helping people find meaning in their lives. And then right before going to publication, he it has a little bit of a, a, a roadblock, right? And so for him, in, afterwards, after getting out of, of two different um, camps, he finished his book. And one of the things that he says is that humans are driven by the necessity to seek meaning in their lives by committing to a cause or a purpose outside of themselves. So the commitment to a cause of something bigger than us individually. We're contrib uh, contributing to something outside of ourselves. And he goes on and talks about that commitment a little bit deeper. And he says, without meaningful commitment, 
then we find that that suffering that we're going through and his suffering was obviously physical suffering emotional trauma and being part of in a concentration camp suffering leads to despair right and on the flip side with meaningful commitment with intention with goals like you talked about with with something in mind outside of ourselves the suffering that we go through um, leads to things like resilience and strength and persevere, uh, perseverance. And really, the, the difference there isn't the circumstances. The difference is our response to the circumstances. Right? We can't always control the things in our lives that determine where we are at. Um, and so it's how we respond to the things that are external of us that ultimately provides whether it's meaningful commitment or um, or not. And as I was digging further, the uh, you know if we are not in a conscious effort, if we're not intentionally moving toward a greater version of ourself or a more fully expressed, authentic version of who we want to be, the result is not guaranteed. Right? We're not going to continue to move forward if we're not consciously attempting to move forward. The default is that we wake up six months down the line or 12 months down the line and all of a sudden we're like, what happened? Where did, where did I go wrong or what, what was the thing that kind of took me off track? Um, and we find ourselves, if we're not meaningfully and intentionally working toward that, we have this void. Um, and in one of the things I read, they called it an existential vacuum, sucking everything, all of our energy in different ways and not really directing it in any specific way. Um, and so we start to fill that existential vacuum or that void with things that don't serve our higher purpose or our greatest good. And we fill them with, with um, other substances, depressants and stimulants. You know, we take sleeping pills to help us sleep and then we drink coffee to help us wake up in the morning. And, and everything is, everything is outside of ourselves and we just kind of get into the habit of going through the motion. And one of the things that was, I found fascinating because after you had made the comment last week that there's no manual, you know, there's no, um, you know, what I wish I would have known before moving into an independent facility or something like that, I started to look at what research was out there and I found this um, researcher, and I just wanted to put his, his, his biography up here a little bit because I found what he said, a quote that he shared, so compelling that I thought, okay, well, I need to know that he actually knows what he's talking about to value an opinion. But he's the Senior Associate Dean for the Center of Healthy Aging and Distinguished Professor of Psychiatry at UC San Diego in the School of Medicine. And then he was the senior author of this medical paper that was called Lonely in a Crowd, Overcoming Loneliness with Acceptance and Wisdom. And basically what they did for this was they went into a facility like we have here and did a 90 minute interview with all of the residents um, in regard to their life and their experience before and after coming into this facility. And they found that the most common general theme in their new experience in assisted living or independent living facility was this idea of purpose or loneliness. And, and he said this, and this is what I, he said that was so compelling to me, is that loneliness rivals smoking and obesity in its impact on shortening longevity. That's a pretty bold statement. You know, we've been... Kind of, to, I've been in health for a couple of decades now, and we know that the 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 top causes of death are all health related. There are things like heart disease, and then we have stroke, heart attack, um, blood pressure, cholesterol, diabetes, all these things that are specific to our physical body. But here, this doctor is saying that loneliness is one of the things that rivals our two greatest risk risk factors for longevity and not just longevity but you know um, acknowledging quality of life and get, staying engaged in, in a purpose and so it's really interesting reading through what the findings were 
um, that they were tied to this idea of, of, of loneliness. And so um, we're going to talk about eight different ways that have been shown to assist in direction. And this is for anyone at any point in their life, ultimately, um, to find purpose throughout life. But the first one is that it's the one that we already talked about. It's the one that mo most of us focus on is our kind of our professional trajectory as we go through life as an adult. And it's our work mission. And we've ever heard the thing, we've heard this quote a lot, find a job that you love and you'll never work a day of your life. And um, that's been attributed to a lot of different people. I've seen this quote shared and uh, Confucius has been given credit. I've also seen Mark Twain given credit. But in my research using Google, I found that really it hasn't been attributed to anyone specifically, but regardless of who said it, it is some good wisdom that uh, we could kind of look at that. If you kind of find a job that you love, you don't look at it as work. That's a mindset, uh, mindset difference or mindset shift that allows that greater purpose. And in, uh, there's a Japanese teaching called Ikigai, and this is really kind of the Eastern philosophy version of finding a job that you love and you'll never work a day of your life. But it talks about this idea that it's, you know, Ikigai is this place that merges the things that we're good at, our talent, the things that we're passionate about, that we love, that we're inspired to do, um, what we can make money doing, and ultimately how that contributes outside of ourself. That, if we can find that spot where all of those things merge, that's the, 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 the end result for us. Now, we're not gonna spend a lot of time delving into this because most of the people here at Ovation, this is, the, this is ultimately the past. Um, that doesn't mean that we can't stay engaged in some type of work mission to, to focus outside of, of ourselves, but for the most part, this is kind of, you know, with retirement, typically that's where that ends, but it doesn't have to, right? What would be an example of retirement not finishing or not being a conclusion to a, an individual's work or professional mission? something like volunteering if it would be either an extension of what your profession was or just because it's pleasure absolutely whether it's an extension um, we'll talk about service specifically but that's a great example especially if you know if I'm if I was a professional my whole life and I have an opportunity to use my talents my knowledge and my experience to help someone else that is a great way of looking at it you know a lot of times people will write a book at the end of their career um, and then go on speaking tours and kind of stay engaged in a community that way, even if they don't have to, just because it's what they feel most passionate about. So that's the first thing is to kind of see if there are ways to align our work mission or our, our work of professional purpose currently in the parameters that we have. The second one is love and friendship. You know, finding meaning in loving other people is such a powerful motivator. Um, the connection that we have to other people is foundational in our experience as a human being. Everything around the way that we do things in this society is conditional on other people and interactions with other people. And... Um, loving other people is the powerful motivators, even more than being loved by other people. The act of expressing love outside of ourselves is more impactful than receiving love. And, and that's, that's a distinction that we sometimes don't look at. We think about love is two people or a group of people all kind of working in the same direction. And we don't look at it in terms of receiving or giving love um, as necessarily different things. But finding meaning in loving others, super powerful motivator. And we're finding that the opposite of that, the, that with the lack of connection to other people, is one of the greatest 
um, factors or risk factors associated with addiction and substance abuse specifically. Um, I remember hearing a TED talk several years ago by a man named Johan Hari, and the title of the TED talk was Everything We Know About Addiction is Wrong. And he goes through the, the, uh, some, some research that talks about how our understanding of addiction, um, there are valid points. You know, we do have physical markers that draw us towards certain substances that, that cause habits in our lives. But he so said, what we don't understand is that we look at addiction as the problem. And he said, the opposite of addiction is not sobriety, like we've approached it as a problem. And so it has a solution. The solution is sobriety. The opposite of addiction is not um, sobriety. The opposite of addiction is connection. It's our connection to other people. It's our connection to ourself and our purpose. And when we lack that connection to ourself and other people, that's when we start to see um, our behaviors become negative and habitual and take us down a different direction. And so finding, you know, this is, is a little bit harder later in life because um, one of the things that that same team of researchers did when they were interviewing people that was expressed was, yes, we understand the importance of love and friendship, but it's a lot different. You know, moving in to a facility is very different than cultivating relationships outside of that living facility prior to that. And so there's still, um, there's still a lot, I think, to be learned from that in adapting to that new that new structure, but ultimately it's within ourselves and our engagement with the community outside of ourselves that's going to do that. Um, the more we expose ourselves to other people and the community and, and live authentically, the easier those relationships come into our lives and those connections come into our lives. The more we avoid other people, the, the more we start to find ourselves in that that loneliness rabbit hole of it is really hard to dig out of um, number three is compassion for others um, the other big in, in regard to that research they talked about three main takeaways and one was that the you know generating relationships in this environment is very different than outside of the environment the other one was that there is a direct correlation between wisdom and compassion having implications um, where we're able to identify the difference between being alone from being lonely. So what, what, would that, what does that even mean? What's the difference between being alone and being lonely? Being alone, you can, or you can still be happy and you know, That's do so what, you're, you know, uh, what you want to do. Yeah, being alone really just means it's something that's, that's physical. It's, am I alone right now? Is there anyone around me in this general thing? That I'm alone or I'm not alone, right? Being lonely is very different. It's a state of mind. It's, it's a conscious choice. It's emotionally driven. And so the wisdom of experience and the compassion for ourselves and others have direct correlations with our ability to tie our happiness and our contribution to ourselves versus um, to other people. And a lot of times we are kind of drawn to this idea of you know, a, a codependent or a, an unhealthy attachment where we associate our happiness to somebody else or something else, something external, instead of this idea of you know, being compassionate with ourselves, being fine with being alone and not being lonely at the same time. Um, one of the, the residents that uh, responded positively in those interviews when they were conducting that research said, when I find myself starting to feel lonely, not alone, but when I start to feel myself lonely, I think, go and do something for someone else. And she says, that has worked for her every single day. And it doesn't have to be something big. She said it could be just walking to a general area in this facility and being able to say good morning to five or six people and ask them how they're doing. 
right? But um, we sometimes don't realize that going outside of ourselves and you know have, expressing that compassion for others has just as much of an impact on raising our spirits as it does the person that we're reaching out to. Go ahead. Well, I would change that to say for or with someone else. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because then you get the synergy of the last two combined. You've got the compassion for others and you're building those relationships that are going to um, going to continue to be fostered. Um, I really love this one because this is one that I'm really not good at and that I'm personally working on is, is finding um, appreciation for the small things, small joys and pleasures in life. You know, we like to look at big decisions and big outcomes and big events to be the things that make the most impact in our lives, that cause the most direction change. But ultimately, in the absence of big and grand purposes and goals, learning to appreciate the smallest things is a habit worth cultivating. Watching a bird, noticing plant outside the window, designing elements inside, or simply just having a cup of coffee. Small actions and moments noticed over time compound and have tremendous effect on our outlook and perception. And this is one of the things that I'm really excited about. Most research, biological research, you know, we have looked for decades and years at how certain things impact our biology, our physiology, very quantitative focused metrics where we say this medicine works for this or this type of therapy works for this. But ultimately, um, there's a big shift within research going toward mindset and recognizing how much uh, impact our mindset has on our lives and our experience in those lives. And it starts with being able to appreciate even the smallest things. I used to, it used to drive me crazy as someone that was, um, I don't want to say I was negative, but more just kind of a, a naturally pessimistic person. I always find the what's wrong with the situation in and uh, and didn't realize how much that was dragging me down and everyone around me. And so it was really hard for me to, to look at that and it drove me nuts when people would say, oh, there's always something to be grateful for, right? I'd be like, no, sometimes there isn't something to be grateful for, but but really, when we break it down, there's always something. To, and if we can allow ourselves to slow down enough just to close our eyes, breathe, and look out the window. I mean, these are small examples, things like looking at a plant. Um, there's a lot of power in nature, just looking at the geometry and the symmetry around us, um, observing our interactions with other people and how it impacts us, uh, all our, our assisting us in finding those little bits of purpose and authenticity. Um, the other day, oh. morning, driving over the water rovers, the sun was just, was just getting light, the full moon was out there, and the blue sky was just gorgeous. Yeah, that things like that to me, I never noticed that when I was a little kid, but now, no. anytime I walk outside, I notice the clouds a little bit different, I'm like, oh, that's really pretty, or... Yeah, it's like spectacular. Yeah, here. exactly, the green or green 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 snow, right? Like you would have never caught me saying I was grateful for snow four or five years ago. Now I want to see something else. Yeah, yeah. When it's over there, out of reach, right? Um, all right, number five goes back to what Eric started talking about earlier, is staying strong and healthy. And that's ultimately talking about our body. Um, and we, a lot of times, just like that all or nothing thinking that we've talked about before, that especially applies to our physical health. We find a diet that we like and we think, okay, these are the rules, I gotta stay within this diet and if my exercise program is gonna be effective, I have to make sure that I'm getting to the gym four times a week and that four times a week, it's gonna be 35 minutes of strength training and 20 minutes of cardio and all these different things. But ultimately, when we look at it that way, it's very much outcome focused, it's very much um, outside of ourselves and we're doing it for the wrong reasons. But ultimately, in acknowledging everything that we do is beneficial. Everything is moving that needle. Every step we take is making us that much more mobile. Every rep of exercise we do, every, every bite of every food that we eat has implications on how we feel and, and how we function. And so 
that's a big piece. But along these same lines, a lot of times we look at our physical health as a metric of what, how do we, how does Western society typically determine a person's health? What do we use? What? Our eyes by the way you look. Okay, eyes by the way we look. What's that little square thing in our bathroom? Yeah. The scale, our, right? So the scale. <laughs> the scale is our weight. And I, you know, I've worked in environments where the focus was weight loss. And the reason I don't work in those environments anymore is because I don't like that to be the focus. Because ultimately weight in and of itself, that number on the scale, it provides me no health related information about myself. It doesn't say how much fat I have even, or how much muscle I have. It doesn't say anything about my cardiorespiratory endurance, or my digestive health, or my immune system, or my cognitive function. That number on a scale provides me no information about my health, but I let that determine if I'm gonna be happy or not, if I'm gonna eat or not, if I need to exercise more or not, even though it doesn't give me that information. And we're finding now, even more than anything, those mindset-focused factors um, have a greater implication than even what we what we eat and what how much we move. Um, one of the researchers that I'm really digging lately, her name is Alia Crum, and she was a researcher that was focused on placebo effects of drugs and the nocebo effect of drugs. Um, and she started to think, what if is there a way we could track? physiological or biological adaptations within a person just by changing the way that they think. And so she drafted this, this research called the milkshake study where they took 100 people and they had two milkshakes. They had one that was called indulgent, which was kind of this dessert-based, really rich, high-fat, high-sugar dessert shake. And then she had this one called Sensi Shake, which was um, kind of... Uh, marketed as a protein health meal replacement type shake. And so half the group got the indulgent shake, half the group got the Sensi shake, and then the next week they switched those groups. And the group that got Sensi shake first got the indulgent shake and, and vice versa. And they did that for four weeks. So at the end of the month, everyone in the group had tried the Sensi shake twice and the indulgent shake twice. And the way they measured the physiology response was measuring something called ghrelin, which is our hunger hormone. It's the hormone that tells our body and our mind that we are satiated or starting to get full. And they noticed that when people, when the subjects in that research were eating the um, indulgent shake, the dessert shake, their ghrelin triggered faster. They were full and satiated faster than the other. And it was across the board. Every single person saw those shifts in ghrelin up and down between one week and the next, one week and the next. And then after all of this data and tracking, they brought it together and they communicated. The it was the same shake. The only thing that was different was their belief on whether they were eating something healthy or unhealthy. And it was mind blowing because it was the first bit of research saying that, oh, maybe our mindset does have an impact on how our body actually processes this food. Because ultimately that means I could be a vegan or a strict carnivore. And if I believe that that way of eating is the best for me, my body is gonna respond in that way. And she went on and mimicked that same research in regard to exercise and found the same thing that those that believed they were getting sufficient movement and exercise saw a reduction in weight and in body fat, saw an improvement in their mood and their work productivity, all these things. And those that didn't feel like they got enough exercise saw weight gain, um, job dissatisfaction, low productivity, all this thing, just based on the way we think. And so staying strong and healthy is much greater than just what we eat and how much we move. It's how we interact, it's how we perceive our interactions and the way that we eat and move. Did someone, go ahead. You gotta get a new scale. <laughs> oh. you know, the new ones will tell you your, your fat composition, your muscle composition, yes. and your liquid, uh, how 
as you have in your body. That's absolutely right. Yeah, I, that's uh, that's the the weight the um the book that I just finished writing is called I titled the weight of emotions because the whole concept is that our intention behind our behaviors is more important than what the behaviors are. That's a uh, I guess you'll have to you buy it and read the whole thing because I just told you it was about that. You just have to take it as a data point. You can't take yeah. it as an emotional point. Right here. Yeah, and there's, I mean, there's a, you know, if I have a population, if I'm a doctor and I've got 200 patients under my umbrella, there is information that I can get from my patient's weight and, and body mass index, um, which is height to weight ratio. But on an individual case to case basis, when we're talking about health, it doesn't give me a lot of information. Um, number six is creative projects and play. These are things like hobbies, sports, experiences like art, travel, music, nature, reading, culture. They have all been shown to increase our capacity for experience and building um, empathy for ourselves and others. They also have been shown to decrease chronic pain and fatigue. We don't think about that. You know, I hear all the time that, oh, I'm not going to go on this activity or excursion because... Uh, my back will hurt or my knees will hurt. And, but there's also actually research that shows that the more we engage in these types of endeavors and our perception of them, you know, if our perception is that we're going to go and have a miserable time because our back is hurting, guess what? We're going to have a miserable time and our back's going to hurt. But if we kind of approach it from a different way and look at it as something we're choosing to do because we're going to grow from it, our body is going to respond the, the same way. And this is kind of what I would say our life enrichment program here is tasked with trying to do all of these things. Um, and it's one of the things that we at Infinity Rehab and doing the wellness department and program are trying to bridge between life enrichment so that everyone, we're kind of ultimately working the same thing. Because a lot of times people see us and they think, oh, well, Jared and Kesley and Mareka, they're the exercise and physical therapy people. But ultimately, wellness, like we talked about last week, is much more holistic than just those factors. And so we are trying to, to um, blur those lines a little bit more because this is the most fun out of all of them, too. This is, the, this is where we're going to, to learn new things. And um, I've, I've shared with some people that I really love painting. I love art. And it's not a part of my job. But I love doing it. It's what I it's what I do. I love yoga. I it, people are always uh, surprised when I tell them I don't exercise. I don't believe in exercise. I believe in moving the body. I think it's the most important thing a person can do every day. But if I look at it as exercise, I look at it as something I have to do. And if I don't do it, then I'm going to feel bad about not doing it. If I do do it, I'm going to feel good. I don't want that. And so I live a very active lifestyle. But I don't exercise for an outcome. I do it because it's what I enjoy. I do it because I feel the best when I move my body the most. And so doing those things and doing them for the right reasons is huge. Uh, contributing to the world as a whole. This doesn't always mean you know, direct service. We sometimes think about contributing to the world outside of ourselves. It has to be me going and donating my time and energy and money or focus towards some project or something. That's not necessarily always the case. It will help. But, um, you know, writing. My grandma used to write letters to the editor way more than they were ever published, right? Um, so things like that, contributing your opinions to, you know, something outside of ourselves. You know, web platforms, chat rooms. You know, journaling is huge. Um, I love reading things that my ancestors wrote in journals and letters that they wrote to each other. I get a lot of satisfaction out of that. And I don't think that any of them, when they were sitting down and journaling, were thinking about that act as a contribution to the world as a whole, even though it impacts me on a day-to-day -day basis. So... Um, it could be something like that. It could be a social cause that you believe in. Um, donating time outside of yourself helps distract our attention toward um, more authentic endeavors for ourselves, and then ultimately um, leaving legacy. And a legacy is more than just inheritance. 
uh, by asking ourselves this question. What kinds of gifts do I want to leave the world? And just kind of pondering that. You know, you can write it down if you want. You don't necessarily need to. But, but having that question const consciously in the back of our mind. You know, what is it that, what kind of gifts do I want to leave the world? Not, not what money am I going to leave, which relative, but what do I want my actual legacy to be? When people hear my name, what do I want that to represent? And then, once we have a clearly defined idea of what we want our legacy to be, then all of those other previous steps that we talked about are going to lead up ultimately to this because all of our actions are going to be aligned to that same purpose. And that's going to kind of take us to this last piece there. Um, the, uh, this was a direct quote. The experience of aging, in fact, of life in general can be bitter, sweet, tender, or tough. How will you react to them? And along those same lines, this was... Um, Viktor Frankl, who was, like I said, twice interned into a concentration camp, um, in his book, Man's Search for Meaning, this was kind of the conclusion. In the final analysis, it becomes clear that the sort of person the prisoner became was the result of an inner decision and not the result of the camp influences alone. He recognized that a person's growth through that horrific experience was more to do with their perception and what they are learning from it more than it was the specifics of uh, the influences of the camp itself. So ultimately, it is up to each one of us to figure out what our legacy is, uh, what we want our legacy to be, I should say, and then ultimately, consciously and intentionally make those day-to-day -day decisions following some of those um, things we talked about in order to, uh, to find a little bit more fulfillment, to find happiness, to avoid being, a, uh, lo to avoid being lonely um, versus being alone. Anyway, what questions or comments do you have? I would, I would change the, the word or up there to and because as you age, you're going to go through all those. Very yes. And tough. We'll do it right now. That way. Very good. Eric. Then it's real. Then it's real. <laughs> and tough. I like that. Because it is. It's a spectrum. It's, it's a little bit of everything. And even when things are tough, we can look at them from through tender or sweet eyes and, and learn from them so that they help move us forward rather than angering us and putting us back with negative emotion. Yes? Can you go back to the frame before that? Uh, yeah. Uh, basically, I think was talking about yeah, legacy. Uh-huh. Um, I, uh, I, I, it's... Well, philosophical, I guess, but I, I don't, I, I can't see wondering what I'm going to leave behind, what I'm going to leave to my kids, what am I going to, because when I'm gone, I'm gone. Yeah. I'm gone, uh -huh. really gone. And, <laughs> you know, and it, what, it, what I mean is, and I, I've been very, very, it's something as I age, I, but I started up maybe in my 40s and 50s, is that I really don't set a goal of anything that I'm going to leave behind. Mm -hmm. um, it's, I want to get that done while I'm alive so that I can see the smile on whether it's my kids and so forth. And so I, I guess I just have a little bit of a thing of worrying about my legacy yeah. um, as opposed to worrying about the now and the present. And no, I, I, I appreciate that. I mean, I, I am 100% in agreeing with you. And for, for someone like you, well, for all of us, all we really have is the present moment. We don't have the past. You know, when we have thoughts of the past, that's what they are. They're just a thought of something that's already happened. We can't do anything to change that, right? The future is the same thing. 
Yeah. Right? It's just the thought of what we hope to have or accomplish. All we have is right now and the experience that we have in this moment. And so, yeah, the, the idea of, of a legacy or, or thinking about what our legacy may be isn't necessarily what we hope for someone else. Because, you know, those experiences that you're talking about currently are creating, whether we like it or not, that's going to serve as what our legacy is once we're gone with our loved ones or our, our friends and family. They're going to remember us as somebody that lived wholeheartedly in the moment and, and wanted to do something intentionally to see a smile on my face while they were still here. And uh, yeah, and that's a great thing also is that we all get to decide what that means for us individually. Right? We, we live in a, a society where it's right or wrong and there's so many, we, we like to perceive things as black and white. And we see someone else's experience completely different from ours. And because we believe so hard, wholeheartedly and intensely about our path, when we see someone else on their own path, we say, well, they must be off of a path because it's so far different than mine. But we all get to decide all of this for ourselves. We only get to, to live our own individual life and have our individual experience. And so why waste it on anything that's other than joy like Eric started you know the things that are, are bringing us joy in the moment because that's ultimately what's going to uh, to to put us where we hope to be whether we hope to be there or not <laughs> Dude. Well, this Christmas I gave away all my jewelry yeah there you go <laughs> grandkids and uh, I did it mainly because I didn't want someone else to do it and not give them what I wanted. And they wouldn't give it a loop. A lot of <laughs> yeah. they, don't know, they don't know the real value of it. Well, I wrote them each a letter saying where it came from and when I got it. A lot of it was inherited. I inherited it. See, and that's awesome. And just I bet you felt real good about doing that, just yeah. like you was just saying. Because in, in, you're alive now and you can experience that. Yeah. Whereas... Why, what, what kind of joy do you think you'll get when you're dead? I mean, <laughs> it just doesn't happen that way. And that, I think this, for me, I, that I've been living my life this way for 40 some odd years as far as um, the last thing I want to do is to die with a lot of money. Mm -hmm. um, matter of fact, I always used to tell my, my mother-in-law because she was, she would want to you know, be careful and make sure you have enough money uh, in order to turn the lights out correctly. And um, and I'm just really, I would much rather bounce my last check. <laughs> I really would. I, and and I, I've set some goals for myself as far as, you know, yeah, I, I want to leave, make sure that my, my kids, are, I have two boys, and, and I'd like to leave a little bit for them, but I want to leave a lot. Yeah. And I don't want, I want to, I want them to, I, I help them go about um, in, with some big numbers sometimes because I get to see the joy on their face. Yeah. Um, that's awesome. That's my legacy now. Yeah. I'm enjoying I, my legacy now. I love both of those examples because it does, it does make it more present. You know, my, my grandmother who passed away couple of years ago she collected little turtles and so when she passed she had like 40 grandkids and kids and all these people and we're like well what do we do with the turtles and like everyone just kind of we didn't know the history of any of them or what she wanted to do with them but but like the idea of having the acknowledgement for him that would have been really really cool to know the story of the individual item and to be able to make that person-to-person -person connection. I think that's very valuable, very cool, yeah. I have a problem, and that is being an only child. I like to be alone. Yeah. <laughs> and particularly for me, I have, I have never been to a place like this. Mm -hmm. And um, so many people tell me, you just don't get out of your apartment enough. And many things, I brought a lot of things with me that needed to be gone through, which I'm still doing. Yeah. And that's satisfying to me to unload the stuff. But my problem is how do I explain to people 
It's not that I don't like people. Uh, I just have things that I enjoy being alone and I have things I need to do. Yeah. Because they always say, oh, you stay in your room too much. Well, if you're happy and you're content in saying that, then you don't owe anyone an explanation at all. That's, that's the only True. explanation that anyone is owed is that I do it because I'm content and it brings me joy whether or not I, whether or not someone else understands it, that's up that's on them, not on you. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Any other final comments before we let you guys head out and I want to know why um, relative to this mm -hmm. the full conversation. Yeah. It would be as some input into it. I'd love to know why now, I don't know the group ovation or what is it, down here or whatever. I don't know these people. I understand there's a guy named Mike or something. He's the yeah, he's the owner yeah. of I'd love to get I'd love to see what their reason was for doing this. Because I understand he's a really nice guy. And uh, so is there prime motivation to make money? No. To do to do okay. these like comp yeah, like this this whole comp so this I would be surprised if Mike has any Rick. I, uh, Rick, Rick Rick yeah Rick um, um, I would be surprised if he's even aware that we are doing these wellness discussions this is this is mostly because um, because of my <laughs> my um, hope to add more value to what it's already doing. Um, so Infinity Rehab is, you know, we, it's, it was really confusing for me. When I started working here, I'm like, wait a second, I thought you I was work working for, for Ovation, ovation but for ovation. no, I'm an actually an employee for, of Infinity Rehab, but I work only here. Like Infinity Rehab doesn't have other locations, well they do, but not that I work at. So I am an employee of Infinity assigned at Ovation. And so our wellness program um, at Infinity has had the outreach. The intention has been, we want wellness to mean more than just exercise classes on the schedule that people can take. Because the ultimate idea of an environment like this is creating the most holistic, well-balanced um, life experience for the residents. And so a big piece of that is acknowledging that, you know, it's not just the exercise piece that makes us well and healthy, it's all of this other stuff. And my background is I love to teach um, and I love research. And so I pitched the idea just to our, just to um, Mareka, who's our, outpatient supervisor here and the the uh, Chuck and Yvonne and those that work here and they said yeah it sounds like a great idea we'll see if it goes and has legs and if it takes off and people find value great and if it doesn't we haven't gone backwards and trying to add more value so that's the whole intention is I mean they're not ovation Avamir infinity isn't losing or gaining anything out of this. I get paid the same whether I'm teaching this class or not. This is just my hope to contribute a little bit more based on my background and experience than I do just teaching classes. So where is Infinity it's located? It's, uh, it's, 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 my, it's my understanding that Infinity is a subsidiary of, of uh, Avenir. Uh, oh. Avenir has about 58, I think it is, senior yeah. living places with their businesses around the country. And Infinity is part owned by Avamir part owned by and Avamir. licensed in about half of those facilities so to provide the... And, and Rick Miller created this place because it was his idea that he wanted a place for his grandparents uh, mm -hmm. to be taken care of. Yeah. This, this is, is, wow. this is well, the real one family from South Lake. I don't know a lot about... Portland, Oregon. I don't know a lot about yeah. it. Portland, Portland, Portland area is very good. Yeah, and so that's, I mean, that's, that's what it really is, is that, uh, you know, my intention is, in doing this, is that I would hope that not only the residents here see value, but then some of our other parent companies realize that we can do a lot more than we're currently doing just with 
you know, pool classes and strength and balance classes, then uh, yeah, so that's the idea of the intent. And if there are con if there's content that you are interested in, that's what that little box is. It's sitting on one of those desks. I brought it in here. And if it's not in here, it's sitting in the wellness center. If there are topics that you want to cover in here or have a discussion about, because I don't want to just stand up here and present and lecture. I want it to be an open discussion. I want it to be something that people find valuable. And my life experience, where I'm at at 42 years old, is very different than everyone that lives here. And so what I think might add value to the residents might not apply at all. So if there are things that you're interested in, please fill out one of those little slips of paper or tell me and we'll, uh, and we'll see what we can come up with. Are you available for a one-on-one -on -one yeah. conversation? Yeah, I do one-on-one -on -one conversations all the time. In fact, I do a lot of one-on-ones with former guests of my last employer outside of this, but yeah, absolutely. All right. Thank you. That's it for the day.